In 2006 in the suburb of Astinapura, a woman named Arimbai begged her husband not to leave her, but her husband, whose name was Pandi, ignored her completely, he apologized to her, then gave her a box containing an heirloom, but he did not explain what the heirloom was for. One month after her husband's leaving, a guest came to Arimbai's house, it was Ratty, Arimbai's younger sister. Ratty begged Arimbai to return to her hometown, because her husband had left her behind. Moreover, back in her hometown, her mother was also seriously ill and needed Arimbai. Upon hearing Ratty's request, Arimbai could not say anything, because she thought this place was the safest place to protect her son, Yuda, from the evil Kurawa group. A while later, suddenly some mysterious people came, and Arimbai felt that something that could endanger her son would happen. In order to protect Yuda, Arimbai told Ratty to leave immediately with Yuda, while she confronted them, but Ratty refused to leave. Soon after, Arimbai suddenly fainted, so Ratty bravely faced the bad guys alone. When Ratty fought against the mysterious group, Arini came to help her, but sadly, Ratty chose to sacrifice herself, so that her sister and Yuda could get away from there. Arimbai's house was set on fire by the mysterious group, and from inside, Arimbai tried to hold the door and told Yuda to escape alone, but Yuda refused to leave his mother. The situation was very tense at that moment. Out of nowhere, suddenly the mysterious box given by her husband emitted a bright light, and a moment later, Arimbai and Yuda were teleported to another place, they both finally survived the mysterious people. Sometime after that, the newspaper media reported the fall of a meteor in the city of Astinapura, which had shocked the residents around the city. A series of other disasters suddenly appeared, a disease outbreak that killed thousands of people and the terror of serial killers everywhere made life in the world become so frightening. Fifteen years later, the story focuses on Yuda's life as an adult. The miracle that happened in his childhood, surviving a group of bad guys who wanted to kill him, did not make his life easier. Yuda has just been fired from his job today, as he is accused of having committed an unpleasant act to his co-worker. That day, Yuda had to go home and he got the severance pay, but the amount of the money he got was not enough. In addition, his mother's condition was also concerning. After what happened that night, Arimbai went crazy and sometimes, she made a ruckus that caused the residents to become restless. Furthermore, he was often late in paying rent. For this time, the landlord gives him only three days to complete his rent payment, otherwise Yuda and his mother must leave the house as soon as possible. The next day, after helping his mother to bathe and also make her breakfast, Erlanga, his best friend, called him. Erlanga told him that today, he would hold his graduation ceremony and he asked Yuda, who was currently unemployed, to be the photographer on his graduation day. The graduation ceremony was just about to start, when Yuda arrived there. He was preparing to take a photo while the best graduate student was giving her speech, suddenly Erlanga's body was thrown onto the stage, black as if electrocuted. Erlanga died instantly, and everyone who attended the event ran away in fear. Yuda then chased the perpetrator who had killed his friend and tried to fight the masked man. However, his strength was not as strong as the masked man, so he had to accept his defeat and was knocked unconscious by the man's punches. Yuda finally woke up, and thankfully, he was not seriously injured from the fight earlier. From the television news, he heard the testimony of Professor Arya, who said that the murderer might be a member of the Kurawa gang, an evil and powerful figure that his mother had feared. After seeing the news, he immediately went to the funeral home to offer his condolences to Erlanga's parents. When he was reminiscing about his time with Erlanga, it wasn't long before Professor Arya came up to him. Yuda remembered that his mother also often talked about the Kurawa, so he finally mustered the courage to ask Professor Arya. Instead of answering his question, Professor Arya asked him to come to his house. Without a doubt, after the funeral, he went straight to Professor Arya's house, who was also Agni's father. Professor Arya explained to him that the Pandavas, Kurawas, giants and gods were real and existed since around the year 300 AD. They are just like us, humans, the difference is that they live in the world of the gods. According to Professor Arya, Erlanga was such a kind boy, so he was probably one of the descendants of the Pandavas, so that was why the Kurawas killed him. Upon hearing that, Yuda speculated that maybe his mother was also a Pandava, so that is why Kurawas took his mother's memory and made her crazy. After he gets a clue about the Kurawas from Professor Arya, he goes back to Erlanga's house to return Erlanga's belongings that he had borrowed. When he entered Erlanga's room to put his belongings, Agni suddenly came. It turns out, she followed him to Erlanga's house. She thought that he was looking for clues to find the perpetrator, so she intended to help him. However, he didn't really trust her, so he told her to go home. But when she said she would give him a map of the Kurawa group's location, he immediately fell silent and then agreed to accept her help. 
Together with Agni, he tried to find clues in Erlanga's room. There, he accidentally picked up a book with Javanese characters. He thought it was just an ordinary book, but when he opened the book, there was a small book hidden inside. Yuda and Agni carefully examined the small book, and finally they found a very familiar place. Later on, both of them went straight to that place. When they arrived at that place, Yuda could see several groups of Kurawas coming. For a while, they observed the movements of the group. When they were about to leave the place, unfortunately, their actions were discovered, so they were both chased by the Kurawa group. They were trapped in an alley and they both tried to fight the Kurawa group with all their might, but because they were outnumbered, they lost and were almost killed. Both of them were cornered by the Kurawas, and suddenly a man with an arrow saved them. After successfully defeating the Kurawas, the man and his brother then took Yuda and Agni to the home base. Arriving at the home base, the man immediately asked his foster mother to treat Yuda's wounds. Agni then introduced herself to the man with the arrow. The man with the arrow is Dananjaya and his brother is Gij, they were the Pandawa members who had saved Yuda when he was involved in a fight in his campus back then, and the woman who was treating Yuda was Madame Ripit, a Kurawa who chose to use her strength to help people. Dananjaya then introduced himself to Yuda and Agni, then he told them that he had complete data on the Pandawas and Kurawas that had never been revealed before. He also claimed that Erlanga was his best friend. They have been working together on a project called, Satria Dua. Yuda, Agni and Queen did not understand what Dananjaya told them about. Gij then showed them a video that was made by Erlanga to explain everything to make them understand better. In the video Erlanga said that at the end of 2022 there would be an apocalypse. The apocalypse in question here, is the rise of the Kurawa and the destruction of the Pandawa. Thousands of years ago, there was a civil war between the Pandawas and the Kurawas. This war was designed to cleanse the universe of greedy people. God then chose the Pandawas as the winner, but Aswatama, the last commander of the Kurawas, could not accept the defeat. Eventually he tried to kill the Pandawas using his deadly weapon, Narayanastra. But in the end, all his plans were stopped by the gods. In the end, all his plans were thwarted by the gods and he was punished by the gods by being revoked from his gem-shaped powers and confined to the Padala dimension until the end of time. However, 15 years ago, precisely when a meteor fell on the city of Astanapura, Erlanga suspected that the meteor was Aswatama's gem, which was purposefully dropped by the gods, as a sign that the war was about to start again, which is proven by the revival of the Kurawa group and the emergence of various problems, such as natural destruction, corruption, unending epidemics and also the death of the best Pandawas, to free Aswatama. The government once created a Pandawa protection group to overcome the crimes of the Kurawas, but unfortunately the group was opposed by Kurawa defense officials for various reasons. The officials even killed the Pandawa protection group and freed the Kurawas to find the best Pandawas to be killed, for the sake of Aswatama's freedom. Out of concern for Yuda's safety, Agni took Yuda back to his house, as well as to confirm Arimbai's condition, whom she believed had Pandawa genes in herself. But when they arrived at his house, it turned out that the house had been vacated by the owner. Knowing that the house had been vacated, Yuda was very angry, because based on the promise he made with the owner of the house last day, he still had two days to pay off the outstanding rent. Unfortunately, the landlord didn't want to know about it, so he still kicked Yuda out and gave him a letter written by Arimbai. The letter had Yuda's previous home address written on it. Yuda, Agni and Queen, then headed straight there. Shortly, when they reached a bridge, they decided to walk, because the bridge was not passable by car. While walking to his old house, Yuda told them a little about his past. Shortly afterwards, there was a gunshot that made Queen run away in fear. Yuda and Agni immediately went in to check what was really going on. It turned out that Arimbai was there and it was the sound of a gunshot that hit Arimbai's stomach. Arimbai sensed that this was a dangerous situation, she then told Yuda and Agni to run away. However, a masked man who was already in front of them, managed to block them. The masked man used his strength to force Arimbai to give the object he wanted, but because Arimbai did not want to give it, he attacked her. Yuda tried to attack him back, as the masked man directed his power at Arimbai. However, Arimbai was unable to survive the attack. Arimbai died from the masked man's attack. Before breathing her last, she told Yuda to take a box that she buried with Yuda's umbilical cord. She also advised Yuda to keep the object well and not let it fall into the wrong hands. After burying his mother properly, Yuda immediately took the object his mother was referring to and it was the Brajamasti heirloom. According to Dan and Jaya, the object was given from generation to generation by Gadakaka's descendants. This means Yuda has that special gene. Gadakaka is the one chosen to protect all the Pandawas. 
After knowing that fact, they decided to return to the home base and find out the use of the object. Once they arrived, Yuda asked Gij to interpret the Javanese script written on the Brajamasti heirloom. He thought the writing was a mantra. After Gij read the writing, nothing happened and they finally gave up. But moments later, while Yuda was chatting with Dan and Jaya, Gij screamed, because the Brajamasti heirloom reacted when he accidentally threw it on the floor. Based on what had happened earlier, they finally understood, it needed some kind of impact to activate. Yuda then took an initiative to give a hit, by punching the object. When Yuda did this, nothing had happened, there was no effect shown. Suddenly, Dan and Jaya offered his idea and brought them to a temple. He thought the temple was where Yuda's ancestors were, and maybe they could help activate it. It turned out, Dan and Jaya's words were true. When Yuda started hitting the Brajamusti heirloom at the temple, the object immediately reacted and its power entered Yuda's body. The new problem arises. Yuda has not been able yet to control the powerful power given by the heirloom. Luckily, Dan and Jaya is there ready to help him. He deliberately shoots Yuda and finally, he is able to control the Gatakaka's power. Later, in the evening, Agni and Gigi had to take care of Yuda who had a fever, because his body had to adapt to Gatakaka's power that he had gotten earlier. At the same time, Dan and Jaya decided to resume the Satria Dua project, because he thought, even though Erlanga had died, there was Yuda as Gatakaka's descendant who was ready to help him get rid of Aswatama from this world. Day by day the Kurawa members are getting more and more increasing in number, and they are ready to welcome Aswatama's freedom. Elsewhere, the masked man was seen heading to the Padala dimension to give the souls of the Pandawas he had captured. He also offered some of the power of the red gem on his forehead to Aswatama, then he fell unconscious from exhaustion. A moment later, a man called Beckin came. Beckin was apparently sent to take the Brajamusti heirloom and also Yuda's soul. Those two things later will be used to open the gate, so Aswatama can get out of prison. If Beking succeeded, Aswatama will make him the Kurawa commander who will never be defeated. The next day, news of another mysterious murder is reported on television, and the victim is a running athlete. To find out who committed this murder, Yuda, Agni and Dan and Jaya disguised themselves as members of the Nafis, Indonesia Automatic Fingerprint Identification System, to obtain gene samples from the victim. After successfully obtaining the gene sample, Dan and Jaya immediately conducted a test, and it turned out to be true, that the victim had the Pandawa gene. But something unexpected happened, Dan and Jaya discovered that the perpetrator of the murder also had the Pandawa gene. They couldn't believe this fact, and to prove all this, they immediately proceeded to track down the perpetrator's location, and it happened to be at an old abandoned building. The building was allegedly used as the perpetrator's hideout. They tried to find clues and Agni managed to find a bag. Yuda then asked her what was inside the bag, but she did not answer. Then Dan and Jaya came to tell them that Gij managed to track down the perpetrator's identity. It turns out, the perpetrator of the murder name is the mighty Pandega. As soon as he heard the name, Yuda opened the bag and he found a photo of the later Rimbai inside the bag. Yuda then told them that Pandega was his biological father. Agni returned to her home after they had finished their investigation at the old building, because she had an important family event to attend. The man who had liked her for so long, wanted to propose to her. But Agni seems hesitant about her feelings so she doesn't give any answer to his proposal. Nathan stayed for a while to have a chat with her after his parents said their goodbye to Agni's family, and at the same time Yuda came. Yuda came to meet Professor Arya but his arrival made Nathan misunderstand, he thought Yuda's presence was what made Agni not answer his proposal. Out of his misunderstanding, Nathan hit Yuda and cancelled his proposal to Agni. Agni thinks that the cancellation of her and Nathan's marriage is not an important issue at the moment, so she invites Yuda into the house to meet her father, Professor Arya. Yuda tells Professor Arya all of his problems, and after hearing his confession, he immediately invites them to enter his private room, which is highly guarded, for so many heirlooms are kept inside. He showed him a book that stated that Aswatama would be free if he collected 100 Pandawa souls. But he still does not believe that it will happen soon. He changed his mind, after Yuda showed him the Brajamusti heirloom. Shortly after Yuda showed him the heirloom, Professor Arya then showed the heirloom that could protect Agni. But when she held the heirloom, she suddenly fell unconscious. Unfortunately, when Yuda was about to take Agni to the hospital, at the same time, he received the call from Gij that they had been attacked by the Kurawa gang. Yuda was confused about what to do, but Professor Arya told him to go to help his friends. Yuda was forced to leave Agni who was still lying helpless. Dan and Jaya, Gij and Madame Rippet were defeated by Becking in the attack. 
Beking, as the leader of this attack, then ordered his men to finish them off, but before his men could kill them, Yuda had arrived and the fight started again. After defeating all Bising's men, Yuda is ready to face Beking. Thanks to his Gatakaka's power, Yuda now could easily knock him down. Yuda then asked Beking to tell who was the one who had ordered him, but before Beking could say who his boss was, suddenly the masked man came. But unexpectedly, instead of attacking Yuda, he directly attacked Beking. Yuda was curious about the masked man's actions, so he invited the man to duel. Finally, Yuda realized that the person he was facing was his own father. Yuda finally managed to defeat Pandega, but when he wanted to kill him, Gitch suddenly came to stop him. Gitch stated that Pandega was not Bising's boss, but he is a member of the Pandawa Protection Group. Pandega finally realized that the boy in front of him was his son, Yuda. He thought that Yuda and Arimbai had died when the Red Gem fell to Earth 15 years ago. Yuda left Pandega without saying anything, because he felt disappointed with his father, then he left to help Dan and Jaya, but the latter told him to leave to save the other Pandawas before it was too late. At this point, Yuda left Dan and Jaya, and headed straight to Professor Arya's house to see how Agni was doing. But when he got there, he found Queen lying unconscious, and he immediately helped her. While he was helping Queen, Yuda accidentally saw the wallpaper on Queen's cell phone. He saw a strange symbol that looked the same as the symbol he had seen in Professor Arya's private room. Yuda then felt suspicious, so he went to the room to confirm his suspicion. Later on, he found a mask behind the drawer with the strange symbol engraved on it, just like one he saw on Queen's phone. It was the same mask that was often worn by Kurawa's boss or Aswatama's right-hand man. A few moments later, Pandega came up to him to apologize and explain that he and Professor Arya used to be close friends. Professor Arya was the one who had helped cut Yuda's umbilical cord. It is said that Yuda's umbilical cord could only be cut using Professor Arya's heirloom. Pandega also told him the reason why he left Yuda and Arimbai. It was all because he wanted to protect them from the Kurawas back then. Unfortunately, the Kurawas had already arrived earlier than him and he thought that both of them had died. Pandega then showed Yuda the Brajadena heirloom, still in sign language, the same language he used to explain his reasons to Yuda earlier. Pandega said that if they were able to unite the two heirlooms, then they could penetrate the Patala dimension, where Aswatama was imprisoned. Agni woke up from her unconsciousness and found her feet and hands bound in chains. It was then that she finally knew that Aswatama's right hand was her own father. He was the masked man who had killed the Pandawas and gave Aswatama the souls of the dead Pandawas. Professor Arya then admitted that he and his wife used to be a group of Pandawa protectors. But some of them chose to quit, thus making him fed up and he dared to criticize them. But apparently, as a result of his actions, his legs became paralyzed and his wife died. So we can conclude that the reason why he allied with Aswatama was to take revenge for all that had happened to him and his wife. At the gate of the Padala Dimension prison, Pandega and Yuda were still trying to fight Beking and his men. However, Pandega sent Yuda away to save Agni, who was also in danger and he would fight Beking alone. Two fierce battles ensued at the same time. Despite having the power of Gatakaka, Yuda still couldn't win easily against Professor Arya, and on the other side, Pandega was defeated by Beking and thrown into the pond. Professor Arya was very happy to see their defeat, then he told Beking to immediately finish them all. But suddenly, Beking betrayed Professor Arya. Beking deliberately betrayed Professor Arya on orders from Aswatama. Arguing that he is still a Pandawa even though he had joined the Kurawas and the Pandawas would never have the right to enjoy the victory. After stabbing Professor Arya with his dagger, Beking also gouged the red gem on his forehead. Professor Arya was dying. In his dying state, he then realized that he had made a big mistake. He apologized to Agni, Pandega and Yuda. He also asked Yuda to end his life because this way he would be honored to die at the hands of Gatakaka. Hearing his father's words, Agni begged Yuda not to kill her father, but Yuda did not want to see Professor Arya in pain, so Yuda was forced to grant his request. Yuda was very upset by all this, he finally got back to attack Beking. Beking, who had gained strength from the Red Gem, became even stronger, and it was hard for Yuda to fight against him. Fortunately, Pandega was there to help Yuda get rid of Beking. However, the power of the Red Gem was so great that Beking managed to stab Pandega. Pandega thought he would die soon so he handed over the Brajadena heirloom to Yuda and told him to combine the two heirlooms to make Gatakaka's power whole and stronger. When the two heirlooms were united, Yuda's form then changed into Gatakaka, and without much waiting, the fight between Beking and Yuda resumed.
While Yuda and Beking were still fighting fiercely, Dananjaya and Madame Rippet arrived and they tried to help Yuda defeat Beking. However, thanks to the power given by Aswatama, Beking is not easy to defeat. Yuda tried his best to defeat Beking. Suddenly, Agni, who had managed to escape from the chains, threw the heirloom given by her father. The heirloom was the very deadly Naryanastra arrow. Thanks to Naryanastra's arrow, Beking and Aswatama were wiped out in an instant, lost as if swallowed by the earth. Yuda's mission to protect the world has been completed.